my childhood when I was just a young old pup there uh, back in the early 80s. And I know some of you were young pups way before then, but you know, there was this wonderful thing uh, that started out back in the 80s, believe it or not, called cable TV. And uh, you know, before there was just four channels, it was ABC, CBS, NBC, and PBS. And then all of a sudden, we got like an extra channel or two, you know? And I remember, and we were talking about this in Sunday school, there was this crazy little channel out of Atlanta, Georgia called TBS, and every, every Saturday and Sunday, they had Georgia Championship Wrestling. Woohoo! You know? And, you know, used to watch uh, the Nature Boy, Ric Flair, and, you know, all, all those guys, and, uh, you know, and, uh, uh, my mom would make popcorn and orange Julius, and we'd watch this wrestling, and my brother and I would beat each other up on the floor, and, you know, that was good family bonding time. Well, the whole reason I bring that up is because, you know, wrestling, you know, you've got good guys, so they call the good guys in wrestling baby faces. I don't know if you knew that. And the bad guys in wrestling, they call heels. And I thought, okay, let's do the heels of the Bible, okay? So the theme tonight is Bible heels, or bad guys, or villains, okay? So that's the theme for tonight, the heels of the Bible, all right? So first question, and there's a lot of clues in the questions, okay? I could probably, you could probably, some of you could probably get it after the first, first word, but here we go. Number one, this Javelin throwing heel only slayed his thousands, but was jealous of the man who slayed his ten thousands. Yes. Saul, King Saul. Very good. And who is the man he was jealous of? Ah, good. That would be our baby face. All right. Yellow team, right? All right. That's one for the yellow team. Red. <laughs> okay. This heel became the world's first vagabond. Yes. Cain. That's one for the yellow team, right? Blue. blue team. Ah. Very good. That's, that's good. You do that right away. Okay. This heel never thought he'd be swinging on his own gallows. Yes. Naaman, wicked Naaman. Haman, excuse me, Haman, you're right. Haman. Haman. Naaman was the leper. Yeah. Haman, wicked Haman. Finally, yellow gets a point. Okay. We need something for the green team? Okay, here we go. Speaking of hanging, okay. This. <laughs> This heel had a problem hanging on to his 30 pieces of silver. Yes. Judas, Judas Iscariot, right? He's, he uh, betrayed Jesus for 30 pieces of silver and then gave it back. All right, green team, cheer. All right, and then hung himself, you know, speaking of swinging. All right, all right, good, good. We are the green team, mighty, mighty green So the green team, team got we a point? We are the green team, we preach Christ. Oh, good golly, we got a four-way tie here. I think that's the first time we had a four-way tie. This is, this is good, this is good. Okay, so this heel, this big crybaby could take no for an answer. However, his wife would not. Ahab, King Ahab, right? He wanted that vineyard right next to his palace. And the guy said no. And so he went home and cried to his wife. What was her name? Jezebel. And she went and, she went and took, stole, the, stole the vineyard. All right. Blue. Wow. Wow. Blue is up. You need to help me out. I, we, we might have to take a picture of this because, this, you know. All right, here we go. This ultimate heel will take an eternal vacation getting sunburned 
at the lake. Yes. Satan. Yellow team, right? Red. Ah. All right. Last question. Here we go. This heel was hired to curse the Hebrews but couldn't do it, especially after his donkey set him straight. Balaam. All right. We green are team. The green team. Mighty, we mighty got a three way tie. We are the green team. Oh, we my goodness. Christ. All right. We're going to have to have a wrestling match right here. <laughs> it's a three way. We'll do some tag teaming. Oh, wait. Wait a minute. This is, this is church. We can't do that. All right. All right. All right. So I'm going to have to come up with a, I'm going to have to come up with a tie breaking. Oh, yeah. All right. Go ahead. All right. Hmm. Heels, heels, heels. No, this is, it's going to be, it's going to have to be, well, it's, it's going to have to be a blue, red, or a green. So, okay, let's see here. This, this prideful heel had a dream, and as a result of his dream, made everybody bow down to his image, except the three Hebrew... Uh, uh, what were you going to say? Nebuchadnezzar. All right. It's a blue team, blue team, blue... All right, red team. All right. Good job, everybody. Tiebreaker, wow. All right, everybody, let's do another video of him. Please go ahead and...
is being taught when you're teaching it, Father God, and search us, Father God. Bring it known to us what we have done wrong, Father God, so we can confess it yeah. unto you, Father God. Yeah. Father God, I ask you to let no one leave here without truly knowing who you truly are Amen. and become Amen. your uh, our God, Father God, in your blessed and glorious loving name I pray. Amen. Amen. Good afternoon, everyone, and it looks like, oh my goodness, afternoon, well, technically it is afternoon, so, but evening, evening. We, we can go with that, they cousins, all right, look, but, <laughs> uh, it still looks like a good amount of people here, so, right now, I would like to say welcome to First Baptist, and we're going to go around and shake hands and say hi, and compliment each other, let's walk around and welcome each other, everyone. Thank you. Thank you for helping us tonight. Yes, sir. Thank you. Hey, My journey over the mountain soon he fails. Jesus has said, I'll never forsake thee. Promise divine that never can fail. Heavenly sunlight, heavenly sunlight, flooding my soul with glory divine. Hallelujah, I am rejoicing. His praises, Jesus is mine. All right, Brother Morris. Yes, sir. All right. All right. Got an awesome hymn to sing here. Number five, ten. Heaven came down and glory. My soul. Oh, what a wonderful, wonderful day! Day I will never forget. After I wandered in darkness away, Jesus, my Savior, I met. Oh, what a tender, compassionate friend! He met the need of my heart. Rosa! 
great song that gets me going for worship amen, amen. all right uh, thank you all for being here I'm glad you're here uh, this is another one of these now the video we played this morning how many of you know where that's from does anyone I don't think many of you do we did a series me and dad and the brothers and family uh, for every week and we would do a little Bible sketches and skits to help teach in our people in our church. And so I thought y'all should check that out. So this here's another one. This morning's that's what that was. And then here's another one. This one's a, a newer one. Keepers of God's law. I am the keeper of God's law. So the first few verses of the chapter say that those who keep God's law are blessed. I want to be blessed. Then keep God's law. Okay. That means you never do anything wrong. Oh. Uh, I can't do that. Exactly. What? Yes, verse 3 says that those that keep God's law do no sin. But Romans 3.23 says that everyone has sinned. So how can I keep God's law if I can't? Well, you can't, but Christ can. 1 Corinthians 1.30 says, But of him are ye in Christ Jesus, who of God is made unto us wisdom and righteousness and sanctification and redemption. See, when we become Christians by accepting Christ's gift of salvation, Christ becomes our righteousness. Righteous! So, now we don't have to worry about doing right, right? Because Jesus prayed us? Uh, no. God still says to do what's right. Oh. Okay. Yeah. Oh, I guess I'm not See, God hasn't changed his law. It is still a shameful thing to sin. Oh. Ow, you need to not stop murdering people. But I like murdering people. And besides, Jesus set me free, so I can do whatever I want. Jesus set you free from sin like murder. Hey, it's as simple as this. If God says it, do it. You want to do drugs? God said no. Oh, you must be a Christian. Because it makes sense that Christians do what God says. Let me just say that Christianity is life. Romans 6, 1 through 2 says, What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? God forbid! How shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? As Christians, we're alive in Christ. Stop living in your dead sin. Be a keeper of God's law. Amen. 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 So that's probably 2016, 17, something like that, for those of you that are wondering. Uh, men, would you please come forward for the offering? And Brother Earl, thank you for praying for the offering. <clears throat> Let's pray for our tithe and offering. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for your goodness and your blessings, and we just are amazed, Lord, at how you do meet our needs in so many ways each day as individuals and as a church. We thank you for your faithfulness and your love for us, and as we take this time to give back a small portion of what you've given us, we just pray that we truly might each give from a heart of love, and just pray that you might bless both the gift and the giver, and we just pray that our Savior might be honored and glorified. We ask all these things in Christ's name. Amen. Amen.
Amen. Amen. So how many of us know that we're Christians by our love? Does anyone know Amen. when they see you? Do they know it? Amen. All right, let's all stand. 624, his eye is on the sparrow. Amen. 624. Dad in prayer, mom and dad, they're traveling today. 
They're not traveling right now. Right now they're in a, they're at uh, what's the name of it? I keep mixing it up. It's a weird one. Baptist Bible. Baptist Bible Church in Accomac. And he's getting to see David and Molly as well. So pray for them as they continue their travels. And uh, uh, I also wanted to remind you of the March Madness coming up. We have our clipboards out there and you can see and you can get uh, involved in all the activities and snacks and foods that we'll be doing that weekend in preparation for that. And also the uh, snack next Sunday, there's a sign up for that that you can uh, bring snacks for or food for. Uh, That one's April 2nd. That'll be a month from now. But next Sunday is a regular fellowship time. We'll be able to enjoy the regular activities that we have here. All the all the young people do ping pong, of course, right? And the uh, everyone else will will eat and enjoy fellowship, right? What's that? Bring the food, bring the food to share to fellowship, because fellowship is uh, sharing. It involves sharing. Amen. We share lots of food. I love to share food, especially when people share with me. And also, you want to be uh, getting involved. There's another way you can be of help as well. Uh, the Miller's fridge broke. So if anyone happens to have a fridge, they are in need of a fridge, right? right. <laughs> you keeping it closed? <laughs> Try to keep it closed as much as you can. <laughs> but uh, uh, if you uh, have a, a way of being able to help uh, somehow with a fridge for them or something or help keep their food cold somehow uh that uh it completely went out right just all of a sudden it's just old oh you kicked it or something rebecca man okay all right uh and evangelism this week join us tuesday thursday saturday We'll be getting out into the community. It's been good. The warmer weather's been really nice. People have been out. We've been able to talk to people. So join us out that. Uh, be taking that opportunity. Don't be, uh, don't be the one that is at fault for not giving the message to someone that's in your life as well, right? Now, uh, the missionaries of the week, you'll see there is the Caputos. Well, no, that's not right. The, yeah, the Eccles and the Landons. So one's to Scotland, one's to Australia, and they have some some good updates. I got mine to be able to look at, so you can take those home, be be, no, be checking on them, know how to pray for them particularly, and uh, try to get in contact with them. Uh, they have their prayer. We have the prayer cards that you can get contact information for the website and such as well. Uh, and then I wanted to mention after service tonight, there's still drama class. Uh, I suppose you're, yeah, someone's in charge. I don't know if you're in charge. So Liz has got you covered, drama drama team. So there is class after service tonight. All right, so Brother Isaac is going to be bringing the message tonight. Before that, I, we have Brother Keith, I believe. Brother Keith Hale, yes. And uh, after that, Brother Isaac will come up and give us the message for this evening. I'm excited for that. So excited to hear the message. I got a little preview this afternoon. And uh, I'm looking forward to that. So let's uh, get into that spirit of worship as we, because you know, hearing a message is worship, right? We understand that, right? So let's get in that spirit of worship. And uh, Brother Keith Hale, thank you so much for helping us get into that spirit. All right. Um, In my Sunday school class, I don't know, several weeks ago, somebody asked the question, who is God? And, uh, you know, we searched the scripture. And, you know, first and foremost, God is creator. Um, you know, all the answers are in Genesis. When you go to the very first chapter, the very first book, God is creator. Um, and when uh, Job was getting lectured by God, God was telling Job, I'm creator. So this is kind of a little uh, song, a little homage to uh, worshiping the creator in his creation. So. Yeah. 
sky was one glass ceiling that vaulted out and on down to starry stained glass windows of sunset sand of dawn an out of door cathedral day by day reveal I remember church in the field I remember church in the field the rain fell like the sacraments on the altar of the soil sweat that fell from hands tends to be spoiled Make the spring saw harvest the earth would be I remember church one that you wrote or is that something I can re find somewhere on Spotify? Awesome, awesome. I'll have to look that up later. I really love that one. All right, so real quickly, uh, for those of you who aren't aware, my name is Isaac Valdez and I am an intern here at First Baptist Church in Seaford. I was brought on to staff about, I want to say almost a year ago now, um, and since then I have been working uh, at the required fields of the internship, which require a minimum of five hours, which one hour is devoted to evangelism, one hour discipleship, one hour towards the staff meeting and being discipled by the pastors here, one hour to helping clean up the church, as well as one hour to the EPIC program. And throughout the course of my internship here, I've learned many things, especially in regards to how to deal with people in, per in person. Because um, for those of you who don't know, before I came here, I was very, very introverted. Uh, my family can corroborate this, if you were to ask them. And on top of that, the only sort of ministerial experience I had before ever coming here was mainly working with people online, which really was conducive to the introversion, but really, really made it hard to actually like look someone in the eye and talk to them. So that being said, I was asked to share a brief uh, testimony as well as report of what we do here and what has been done and just to see how many people have been growing here since I first started coming seeing all the families that you know, I remember we would pray over in Pastor Barry's office as a staff now all of a sudden start coming to church more start reading their Bible more and seeing the growth in a lot of the kids after working with them it's just been amazing to see and to be a part of and so and I thank you all for that and so I come here tonight uh, with 
message from the Lord, upon which I was informed that if I'm not done by seven, the messenger will self-destruct. So, <laughs> so that being said, let's go ahead and dive right in. So if you have So, in the Bible, there are a lot of stories that have been told, right? And there are many ways in which one can tell a story. One form of telling a story is called a chiasm, right? That's a big word, but let me help break it down. A chiasm is when you take the beginning of a story, you build it up to a climax, and then you bring it down at the end to the same place where you started. So an example of a chiasm would be, for example, how in the Bible, the tree of life is in the Garden of Eden at the very beginning. And it builds up to the climax of Christ coming to earth and dying for our sins. And then at the very end of the Bible, in the book of Revelation, we see the tree of life is restored in the new heavens and new earth. So we see the tree of life in the beginning, the climax of the story, the tree of life at the very end. Another climax would be, for example, for many of you who know the Lord of the Rings series, right? Great books by J.R.R. Tolkien. The story starts out in the Shire, peaceful, calm, quiet, and builds to a climactic point in which Aragorn is declared king, then it declimaxes to the point where it ends in the Shire again. And so tonight, I'm going to be sharing with you a form of a chiasm. Um, but in order to understand the actual chiasm itself, we're going to start in verse 24 with a parable that Christ tells. So starting in verse 24, we read the following. Another parable he put forth unto them, saying, The kingdom of heaven is likened unto a man, which sowed good seed in his field. But while men slept, his enemy came and sowed tares among the wheat and went his way. When the blade was sprung up and brought forth fruit, then appeared the tares also. So real quickly, for those of you who may not be aware, in farming, right, especially in farming wheat, there are these things called tares. They look like wheat, but they're not. And oftentimes when they would go to the harvest and there would be a lot of tares, the product of the wheat would be diminished after they had removed all the tares. Tares is basically like fake wheat that would grow amongst it. It's a form of wheat. So that being said, in the story, He's telling a parable on a man who goes to sow some wheat, and then his enemy sows some tares in that same field. Then we read in verse 26, When the blade was sprung up and brought forth fruit, then appeared the tares also. So the servants of the householder came and said unto him, Sir, didst thou not sow good seed in thy field? From whence then hath the tares? He said unto them, An enemy hath done this. The servants said unto him, Wilt thou then that we go and gather them up? But he said, Nay. Lest while we gather up the tares, ye root up also the wheat with them. So let both grow together until the harvest. And in the time of harvest, I will say to the reapers, Gather ye together the first the tares, bind them in bundles, and burn them. But gather wheat into my barn. So what's going on here is when the servants discover the tares growing amongst the wheat, they go tell the master, and the master says, Well, we don't want to also uproot the wheat, so here's what we're going to do. We're going to let it all grow out gather it all together, and we're going to take the tares out of the wheat, we're going to sift through them, and once the tares are taken out, we're going to bundle them up, and we're going to burn them. We're going to stick the wheat in the harvest house. So, keeping that in mind, we fast forward. There are a few other events that go down, and then we get to verse 36 of Matthew chapter 13. Matthew chapter 13, verse 36, we see the following. Then Jesus sent the multitude away, and went into the house, and his disciples came unto him, saying, Declare unto us the parable of the tares of the field. Right? So after everything is done, the disciples are confused about that one parable. So they ask Jesus about it. And Christ, here's where the chiasm idea comes into play. We're about to see starting point, and then we will see the climax of the conversation, followed by the ending point at the same place we started. So verse 37, he answered and said unto them, he that soweth the good seed is the son of man, referring to himself. The field is the world. The good seed are the children of the kingdom, but the tares are the children of the wicked one. The enemy that sowed them is the devil. The harvest is the end of the world, and the reapers are angels. As therefore the tares are gathered and burned in the fire, so shall it be in the end of this world. The son of man shall send forth his angels, and they shall gather out of his kingdom all things that offend, and them which do iniquity, and shall cast them into a furnace of fire. There shall be wailing and gnashing of teeth. Then shall the righteous shine forth as the sun in the kingdom of their father. 
Who hath ears, let him hear. Right? So Christ explains it. He says, listen, there are going to be two types of people. Those who look like they're going to make it, and those who are actually going to make it. Yeah. Right? Amen. There are going to be plenty of believers, but there will also be plenty of unbelievers who look just like us, mm. who walk like us, who talk like us, who can you know, make themselves out to be a Christian, who know their Bible inside and out, but don't believe a word of it. Mm. That's right, yeah. And to this day, there are many churches who also teach many things that go contrary to the Word of God, right? There are all kinds of different heresies, and it doesn't take too long to actually look the Internet, and you can see more than you can possibly even imagine. Right. And it's crazy, but yet Christ warns us of this. Amen. And in warning us of this, he builds to his climax in verse 44 through 45, and he continues the conversation. And he says, again, the kingdom of heaven is like unto a treasure hid in a field. The which, when a man hath found, he hideth, and for joy thereof goeth, and selleth all that he hath, and buyeth that field. So upon explaining a parable that the disciples didn't understand, he then proceeds to give three more. The first one, he talks about a man who sees this field with a very, very valuable treasure on it. A treasure so valuable that the man took the for sale sign down so that nobody would call the realtor, right? He didn't want anyone to buy it. He hid it. So that way he could sell everything that he had to buy that field. Now think about this. If you were to tally up everything that you own, whether it be stocks, real estate, the couch in your living room, right, the shoes on your feet, if you were to tally up everything that you had, how much would it be worth? Just rough guesstimate. Anybody? All right? So I hear some people saying not much. Right? And then I've seen some people who, a point whenever I thought I didn't have much, I was like, okay, I have a little bit more. And then there's other people who's like, man, I have a lot. I look at them like, maybe it's not, maybe I don't have nearly as much as I think. But we all have a lot of things that we hold near and dear to our hearts, right? Could you imagine having to sell everything that you had? To gain something, or something being so valuable that you got rid of everything, that you sold your house, you sold your car, your couch, your TV, you got rid of your cell phone, even the very clothes on your back, to be able to purchase this item. How valuable must that be? And we see again, Christ talks about the kingdom of heaven. The second parable, verse 45. Again, the kingdom of heaven is likened unto a merchant man. Seeking goodly pearls. Verse 46. Who when he had found one pearl of a great price, went and sold all that he had and bought it. Again, we see another parable. Paralleled with the one we just read. Where a man saw something so precious and valuable, he gave up everything for it. Everything. And again. Have we ever seen anything worth everything? Verse 47, you finally reach an unclimax, right? He finally circles back around to the beginning. Verse 47, and again, for the third time, the kingdom of heaven is like unto a net that was cast into the sea and gathered of every kind, which when it was full, they drew to shore and sat down and gathered the good into the vessels, but cast the bad away. So shall it be in the end of the world, the angels shall come forth and sever the wicked from among the just, and shall cast them into the furnace of fire. There shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. So he finally circles back round. Right? So he tells them, look, in the end, God's going to separate the good from the bad. He will separate those who are his children from those who are not. And those who are not his children will be cast into hell. Hell is real. And if you are not his child, you will be in that group. Right. But here's the thing, though. And again, with the chiastic structure, the climax is one of the most crucial elements. The climax being that man who got rid of everything mm. to gain that one thing. Yep. Now, let me ask you this. Let me go back to my notes real quick. When was the last time you gave up Something very, very valuable. Something you held dear. 
Maybe you had, it was your first car that your father gave to you or helped you fix up or maybe that you bought with your own money. You were so proud of it. And then something happened when you had to give it up. Or maybe, you know, you were making a lot of money at this amazing job, right? You were the top seller, right? You were the head honcho. But then you had to give up the job for something else that was more important. Maybe it was family. Maybe it was a tough situation. Maybe it was taking care of those you love. There are many things in this life that happen. And there will be many times, for, if you haven't had to do that, where you eventually will be called to do that. But here's the thing, though. That man is us believers. Because you see, here's the thing. There is this false belief that somehow all you have to do to get to heaven is mumble a few words right. and say a prayer and voila, you're in. And yet, even more unfortunate, there are many great men and women who I've known personally who hold to this heresy. Mm -hmm. And I call it a heresy yep. because as we're about to see in the Bible, that this is equally as flawed as the idea that we have to earn our way into heaven. That's right. Yeah. Yes, sir. So turn, if, turn with me, if you will, to Luke chapter 14. Luke chapter 14, verse 26 through 33. So Luke chapter 14, starting in verse 26. Now in my Bible, I don't know how many of you have this, the words of Christ are written in red, right? Some Bibles have this, some don't. In my Bible, all these verses in this passage are in red. So that being said, these are the words of Christ himself. So please don't shoot the messenger. <laughs> so Luke chapter 14, verse 26, says the following. If any man come to me and hate not his father and mother and wife and children and brethren and sisters... Yea, and his own life also, he cannot be my disciple. Let me say that again. If any man come unto me and hates not, which means does not hate his father, mother, wife, children, brethren, sisters, yea, and his own life. How many of you all love your life? Some of us struggle with that. Mm -hmm. Others of us love it way too much. Right. Yeah. But here's the thing. Do you love it more than Christ? Oh, there you go. Oh, here's the thing. Again, throughout all of Christian history, you can read about it in any book. There has always been a point and place and time where people have had to make that decision. Do I love my life more than I love my Savior? The Apostle Peter was faced with that twice. The first time, he denied Christ three times. The second time, as the history books record, he said to the crucifixioner, Hey, when you hang me on that cross, please hang me upside down, because I'm not worthy enough to die upright as my Lord did. And again, there have been many other people throughout history who have been faced with this very same dichotomy. Do I choose to live? Or do I choose Christ? Yeah. Yea, even your own life also. He cannot be my disciple. And whosoever doth not bear his cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. That's right. yeah. Now listen. What is a cross? Instrument of death. Yeah. Instrument of death. There we go. In Christianity, we've kind of mellowed down what that instrument of death is. Because we wear it around our necks, we put it up all over our churches and on mugs and with you know, inspirational quotes. You know. We've really mellowed down the true meaning of this phrase. The idea, you're to take that instrument of death, the very thing which will kill you, take it up and follow after Christ. Yes, sir. For many martyrs. This passage could be read. 
Take up that machete that that man over there will behead you with. Follow me. Take up that gun by which they will put you on your knees and kill you for my sake. Follow me. Take that hangman's noose that they will hang you from for following after me. Follow me. Take that stake by which you will be burned. And follow me. Take the sword by which your blood will be shed and follow after me. Pick up your cross and follow me. Amen. Yeah, this is the words of Christ. This is what he demands of us yes. as believers. That's right. yes. And to think that we could get away with just coming to church once a week, listening to a feel-good sermon, walking away as it goes through one ear and out the other, living our life as if nothing happens, and to think that the cost of following Christ is that simple. You know, a man told me years ago, I was just a child, I'd never really known much about Christianity other than what I learned in Sunday school, which, to be fair, was more than what many people today still know. But I remember him telling me, he said, look, I know that you're young, and I'm going to tell you this. If you choose to follow after Christ, people are not going to like you. I remember him saying, I've seen so many people who walked away from the faith just because of this. <laughs> For many, that's all it takes. Just, <laughs> you're a Christian? <laughs> you go to church on Sunday? Come on, man. Not that off. We've seen you in private. Come on. Get off that how goody two shoes horse of yours. <laughs> you let go of pornography, dude? <laughs> you out of your mind? You don't cuss no more? <laughs> you wear clothes now? Like, come on, man. Be real. Right? But yet for so many, that is all that it took. And just yesterday, I was talking to a young lady at uh, one of the jobs that I work at when I'm not at church. She had just started working at this restaurant. And afterwards, I got to talk to her about church, and I got to share the gospel with her. And she said, you know, I used to be a Christian. And I said, oh? At that time, we were filling up sauces at the end, trying to get ready for the next day's shift. So we had some time to talk. And so I asked her, oh, so are you a Christian? She said, well, I used to be. My family was, but after COVID, we kind of like stopped going to church, and now I'm just kind of not. So I asked her, okay, so if I was to ask you, why would you say that you're not a Christian anymore? Why is that? And she said, well... I honestly don't believe like a lot of it. Like a lot of what Christianity teaches, I just can't jive with. So I was like, okay, well, is, would you mind if I ask what exactly, like, do you have any examples of some stuff? And she said, well, for one thing, my parents were against makeup. You know, they said that if I was wearing makeup, that I would cause men to lust and then I would be going to hell. She said, and on top of that, there were a lot of other things that I couldn't agree with. And so I just figured, you know what, why am I going to be a Christian if I can't agree with some of that stuff? Now granted, there are some misconceptions in there. Number one, it is not a sin to wear makeup. Just saying, just flat out, I don't see a thou shalt not wear makeup, unless it's in the apocryphal books, at which point I'm not too familiar with it. <laughs> Second hesitation, 317, maybe. <laughs> but here's the thing, though. That is all it took for her. The idea that, hey, you know what? I can't do what I want, so why am I going to do this? Mm. But you know what? The Bible says she's right. Read down, if you will. Verse 28. For which of you, intending to build a tower, sitteth not down first, and counteth the cost, Amen. whether he has sufficient to finish it? That's right. Lest happily, after he hath laid the foundation, it is not able to finish it. And that behold, it begin to mock all that behold it begin to mock him, saying, Ha ha ha! Look at this guy. Verse 30, saying, This man began to build and was not able to finish. Ha! Loser! How many of us have actually counted the cost of what it takes to follow Christ? Amen. Oh, that's good. Yeah. 
Have we actually taken time to sit down and see, okay, if I'm going to be a Christian, what does that mean? What do I have to do? I know that if I put my faith in Jesus Christ, I'm saved. But is that where it ends? No. There is that moment that each of us must have in which we take a moment to sit down and consider, what am I getting into? What does this mean? And then it goes on in Luke chapter 14, in verse 30, or excuse me, 31, saying, For what king going to make war against another king sitteth not down first and consulteth whether he be able with 10,000 to meet him that cometh against him with 20,000? Or else while there is an other, yet a great way off, he sendeth ambassage and desireth conditions of peace. So likewise, whosoever he be of you that forsaketh not all that he hath, he cannot be my disciple. Amen. Now listen. Have we forsaken all that we have? Is there anything in our life that is holding us back from being fully effective for Christ? Because let me tell you, as a Christian, and I've had to experience this firsthand in many ways, there are all kinds of things that you're going to have to give up. And not only that, there are many things that we will have to give up that our culture completely disagrees with. For example, when I was around 12, I grew up in church, and I was around 12, and I started falling away from the faith because I got into a severe addiction to pornography. By the time I was 16, I had so many life problems compounded by the guilt that was issued by the church, by my parents, etc., from having been in all of that, that I reached the point where I said, you know what, God? All these things that I've been through, where were you? Right? I was watching all these people on a screen who made me feel good. You know, I was doing all this stuff. And yet, the very one thing that you, that makes me feel good, that gives me comfort, you asked me to give that up? And at 16, as foolish as I was and as amazed as I am now that God didn't strike me dead then and there, I cussed him out to his face and I told him, you know what? I'm done with you. I'm tired of serving someone who doesn't even understand me. I'm tired of serving someone who doesn't love me. I'm tired of serving someone who let me go through all this pain and suffering, who let you know my family go through all this stuff. And I'm tired of serving someone who doesn't even isn't even there for me. Why would I serve you? Few it was literally a few days later, there was this gentleman in our church who to this day, I have some of the greatest respect for him. Even then, he was one of the few people who I respected in every way imaginable. And he said, you know, I've got a question for you. He said, earlier this week, normally I have this routine, right, where between the price is right and 1 o'clock when I go to the swimming pool for my exercises, I take time to pray over everybody in our church. And I also read my Bible and do my devotions. He said, earlier this week, and I remember I cussed God out on Friday, and he said, exactly, it was Friday, when he said, I was reading my Bible, doing my devotions, just like any other day, and he said, all of a sudden, it felt like the Lord had put a heavy burden on my heart, and said, you, your brother, and there were two other boys from our church at that time, to this Christian camp, right? And so he said, if your parents allow it, would you be interested in going? I had heard a lot about that camp, so I was like, sure, why not? Yeah, it would be fun. And so at that time, I made a deal with God. I said, all right, God, I'll tell you what. You have between now and the end of that camp to either reveal yourself to me in a way that I cannot possibly deny, or I'm not even going to bother pretending to be a good Christian boy anymore. I'm not going to bother being here anymore. So fast forward a few months, I end up going to the camp, and I remember... The camp's theme passage was Ephesians chapter 4, verses 22 through 32. But in particular, verses 22 through 24 stuck out the most to this day, and they've become my life verses in many ways. And the verses are as follows. That you put off, concerning former conversation, the old man, which is corrupt according to the deceitful lust. That you put off, excuse me, that you renew your mind, in this, be renewed in the spirit of your mind, that you put on the new man, which after God is created in righteousness and true holiness. Yeah. If I remember correctly, that's how it goes. 
And yet, I kid you not, every sermon at that camp was pointed to something I had yelled at God about in my backyard. Mm -hmm. That one day, it was almost as if every single one of them were listening in. And by the time the camp was over, I had recommitted my life to Christ. But this time, I counted the calls. I said, all right, God, I know what it's going to take. I understand. This is what you ask of me. I know that you're there. I know that you heard me. My life is yours. I'm quitting pornography. I'm going to quit cussing. I'm going to quit doing all this other stuff. And I left all of that behind. Was it rough? Absolutely. Not going to lie. It was one of the most difficult things ever, especially because at that time, a lot of my friends that I was around, and then even later, a lot of the co-workers I was around, were so saturated with all of that yeah. to the point where it's like, it's all around you. You can't even avoid it. But for some of you, that may not be your thing. For some of you, it may be stealing. For others, it may be lying. For others, it may just be plain old pride, which I'm going to be honest with you, I still struggle with. Yeah. I've gotten a little bit better with, but I'm nowhere near where I desire to be with that. There are a lot of things in Christianity that we have to give up. The Bible calls us to give up. That Christ himself calls us to give up. Amen. Yeah. And yet, so many of us think that we can just slide away without doing anything. Mm -hmm. And it's amazing, because originally, I wasn't even... I was... The Lord had put this on my heart to preach around Wednesday. And I was debating in my mind whether or not I should follow through with it because it seemed like this had been something that had been preached so many times before me. <laughs> but then it was kind of interesting because just hearing all the sermons and teachings throughout today, it just kind of tied in really well, especially with uh, the hymn that Pastor Barry had pulled up earlier today. I'd never heard that song before, but it's one that I now want to learn. And he pulled it up this morning at the end of the service. Thank you, Miss Robin. I gave my life for thee. And yet these are, the words were written as if Christ himself were saying that. It says the following, I gave my life for thee, my precious blood I shed, that thou might ransomed be, and quickened from the dead. I gave, I gave my life for thee. What hast thou given for me? And so, dear Christians, I ask you the same thing. That's right. What have you given for Christ? Yes. With that being said, let's take a moment to just reflect. Is there anything in our lives at the moment that we're holding on to? Any idols of our heart that are taking precedence over Christ? Anything in our life that, you know, we realize there are sin, but we just haven't really let go of yet? Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's right. It needs to get taken care of. Amen. And it's interesting, a few weeks ago, I was asked to teach the children's church in the morning service. And one of the things I love about children is that they have no filter. <laughs> <laughs> they say what is on their mind, regardless of how rude or ineloquent it may be. And the lesson that I was teaching was on prayer. And at one point, I asked them, okay, how many of you love Jesus? And they all raised their hand, and I was like, oh, that's amazing. You all love Jesus. That's great. And so then I asked them, okay, how much do you love them? They're like, this big, this big. And I was like, oh, that is so awesome. So let me ask you this. How many of you love Jesus so much that when your favorite show or movie comes on the TV, you would ask your mommy and daddy to turn it off so that they can read to you the Bible? And one of them was like, well... I don't know. I mean, I, I, you know, that's really hard. But yet, for many of us, yeah. how often do we put down the road low when we get home from work? Mm -hmm. Just take a moment to bask Amen. in the privilege yeah. of having God's words written down for us. It is a You're right. Because right. so right. many people do not have this. And yet, not only do we have this, we have it in overabundance. Yeah, that's good. Yeah. But how many of us take time to do that? How many of us will take time, all of our lunch break at work, to just read a few verses or to pray? How many of us 
take that time out of those things that we hold near and dear to our hearts to get closer to God? What are we willing to give up? So as we're about to close out, I'm almost at my self-destruct point. <laughs> as we're about to close out, let me ask you this. Is there anything in my life that I can give up? Romans chapter 12, verse 1. Romans chapter 12, verse 1. It says the following. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. I love that word reasonable. Right? It's not out of obligation. We are not required to do this to get into heaven. But because Christ paid it all, it only makes sense that we give all. Amen. With that being said, if any of you, if every head is bowed, eyes are closed, dear Christian, you're in here tonight, and there is something in your life that you need to get taken care of, something in your life that is holding you back, 